So, rabbits reproduce really fast. Apparently that's a fact. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with seeing the evidence of this. I happen to live in an area that is urban enough where I don't really see a lot of rabbits in general and when I do see rabbits or when I do see I could say a baby rabbit I actually get pretty excited because I'm like whoa that thing is awesome and I go over to hang out with it and then it freaks out and runs away. So that's pretty much my relationship with rabbits thus far. If I was a farmer I'd probably have a completely different relationship in that I probably wouldn't like rabbits that much uh, in fact, I'd probably be frustrated with rabbits because the multitude of new rabbits would be bad for business and that they are likely eating all of my crops. I would imagine that that's actually how we know about the fact that rabbits reproduce so quickly. It's from a long history of frustrated farmers. Nonetheless, the rate by which rabbits reproduce has become legendary for human beings. So how does that possibly relate to anything mathematical? Well, it does because of something called the Fibonacci sequence, which is something we are going to um, analyze today, obviously. So <clears throat> uh, what is the Fibonacci sequence? Well, the Fibonacci sequence is a pattern of numbers that was either discovered by or stumbled upon by a very brilliant mathematician by the name of Leonardo da Pisa, Italian gentleman who lived back in 1200s or so, also known as Fibonacci. And among other things, he took interest in the rate by which rabbits reproduce, and through his uh, famous thought experiments, he came across this very special pattern of numbers. Now, a lot of people probably know at least a little bit about the Fibonacci sequence because of the, the book The Da Vinci Code, which was a very popular book, I'd say, ten years ago, eight years ago, something like that. It was written by Dan Brown. And uh, I read it. I actually enjoyed it. Um, a lot of people didn't like it. Uh, one of the reasons why a lot of people didn't like it is because it pissed them off because there uh, was a lot of information there that they claimed was not historically accurate. So here's my really angry person. Personally, I didn't care about that. I just thought it was fun. It's definitely kind of a junk food book, but I think it's important to consume junk food every now and then. I think it's actually healthy to do that. So uh, I enjoyed it, and I thought that the stuff that had to do with the Fibonacci sequence was, was pretty awesome for sure. Um, so it definitely put the Fibonacci sequence itself on the map for our mainstream culture, but we're going to go into it a little bit with a little more depth during this video or series of videos. So who was this Fibonacci character? He was, again, a, a very brilliant mathematician who lived a long time ago, and he was, believe it or not, almost entirely responsible for the Western conversion to using Arabic numerable, numerals as opposed to the Roman numerals. If you recall from school, the Western world used to rely on Roman numerals to express numerical values, where something like this would be 48. Now, in my opinion, that's very beautiful, but it's clearly not the most efficient way of expressing 48, whereas the Arabic method is the one that we use today. Obviously more efficient, faster, saves space, and so on. And because of its efficiency, the um, Western world adopted it due to Fibonacci's insistence and um, paved the way for all kinds of important uh, intellectual and scientific shifts in our culture, in our history and paved the way for things like the scientific renaissance, which paved the way for things like the industrial revolution, and so on. So Fibonacci is a very important and significant figure in Western history, for sure. Um, it so happened that he had a side interest, strangely, perhaps, in the reproduction of rabbits. He was fascinated by how uh, 
quickly. Rabbits would overpopulate certain areas. So he sought out to answer the question, if I know how many rabbits I have now, how many rabbits will I have in six months? Or even 12 months? Or even 10 years? So he wanted to see if there was a way that we could use mathematics to predict such a thing. And the way he did it was by setting up uh, something of a thought experiment that required a few crude assumptions. One of them is that rabbits are immortal. They never die. Obviously not true, but for the sake of the thought experiment, he assumed that, even if temporarily. He considered pairs of rabbits to be the fundamental unit of analysis, which is not so much an assumption as it is just a decision on his part. Another assumption he made, however, was that pairs of rabbits remained monogamous. I think this is the proper spelling. And another assumption that he made is that every month a pair of adult rabbits reproduces again and gives birth to another pair of baby rabbits. So I'm going to try to illustrate all this stuff right now by using something of a diagram off to the left. And the diagram will consist of a uh, passage of time, specifically five months. So obviously this is month number one up here, month number two, month number three, month number four and five. And um, Month number one, what do we have? A pair of baby rabbits. That's what we begin with. And guess what? Because these rabbits are immortal, as I was saying before, they're still alive and well during month number two. So first I'm just going to represent the fact that these rabbits are still around through the passage of time. Month number three, month number four, here they are. Month number five, again, the arrow representing the fact that we are dealing with the same rabbits. So the bold arrow will represent the fact that we are dealing with the same rabbits. Baby rats in the beginning grow up to be adults and still alive for at least five months, yes? Then, th this uh, pair that we're dealing with gives birth, because they're adults in month number two, birth to a new pair of baby rabbits. I'm going to represent that with this thin arrow here. So the thin arrow is going to represent the giving birth process, and this thick arrow here is going to represent the same rabbits being represented. And I'm realizing I stole from our original pair of baby rabbits. I'm going to put them back. And uh, guess what? In month number three, this adult pair of rabbits gives birth again to another pair of baby rabbits due to one of those assumptions that every month adult rabbits reproduce again. So it happens again. The giving birth process again represented by the thinner arrow. Well, here's a baby rabbit, or the uh, second pair of baby rabbits that we're analyzing. They grow up to be adult rabbits, so I will represent that once again using the bald arrow. And here they are during month number four. And these baby rabbits, right there, they survive and grow up into fully functioning, responsible adult rabbits in the community. And there they are, again, represented by the bold arrow. So let's back up here. This pair of adult rabbits, because rabbits are immortal, they're still there during month number five aren't they? So I'm going to represent that fact by bringing them down here. 
but let's not forget that they reproduce as well. So I've got the thin arrow. So here's a diagram that pretty well represents the population of rabbits over time incorporating those crude assumptions that Fibonacci made. Now, some things might immediately stand out to you. One of them is the pattern of numbers itself. So during month number one, what do we have? We've got one pair of rabbits. Month number two, still have one pair of rabbits, only the adult version. Month number three, we're dealing with two pairs of rabbits. Month number four, we've got three pairs of rabbits. Month number five, we've got five pairs of rabbits. And if it was to continue, we'd have eight, we'd have 13, we'd have 21, and we'd go on from there. And what some of you are noticing already, I'm sure, is that each number is the sum of the two preceding numbers. For example, two is the sum of one and one, three is the sum of the two preceding numbers, two and one, five is the sum of the two preceding numbers, three and two, and so on. Now the numbers themselves are called Fibonacci numbers and um, they have a really amazing tendency to appear in surprising places in the natural world. So for example, the number of petals on many flowers is itself a Fibonacci number. Also, if you look at pineapples, that's actually the first time I've ever drawn a uh, pineapple, but I think it looks like a pineapple. The uh, spirals around the pineapple, around the fruit, usually a Fibonacci number. And the same goes for the head of a sunflower. So here's a sunflower. I just met somebody that really likes sunflowers. Remember, here's a sunflower. Sunflower, sunflower, sunflower. Crazy stem with spikes coming out of it. Pretty awesome. So that's the sunflower. So again, these Fibonacci numbers show up a lot in the natural world. Now, why is that? Well, the answer is because of the Fibonacci sequence's relationship with two other amazing mathematical phenomenons. And that would be the golden section, golden section, and also the logarithmic spiral. Now the golden section and the logarithmic spiral are going to be covered in the next video or the next few videos. So just stay tuned for that.